Of all the classic film and TV properties to be reheated, revamped, rehashed, rebooted, recontextualized, shamelessly cast into endless iterations, and basically bled of all relevance, magic, and appeal, the saddest is Star Trek. A once thoughtful, occasionally elegiac series of films with a beloved cast in its heyday, which has now been picked apart, bastardized in service of a cultural agenda made cartoonish and banal and a sprawl of mundane content. The second season of Star Trek Picard goes blandly where the previous season had gone before. The show begins with Jean-Luc's resumption of the finer life as a rustic gentleman and retirement. The first and most protracted issue the show labours with is Patrick Stewart's unignorable age. This guy is in his early 80s now, and it shows. Much of his manner and reactions are stilted, and his voice has a brittle, almost clotted quality. And given the exacting standards of Hollywood for glossily streamlined production values, there is the dispiriting implication that these were the best takes they could get under the circumstances with a venerable but antique veteran of stage and screen. It doesn't help that they tend to show him in either low-hanging sunlight, the deep shadows of candlelight, or the glary sharp light of Starfleet corridors and bridges. We are then put through a very long session of exposition and character development with his non-human housekeeper, an interaction that feels contrived for its romantic suggestion, again given that Patrick Stewart is 80 or so, and his leaning in, mouth drooping open for an abortive kiss, looks like an old gent in a retirement home leaning forward to a tottering spoonful of soup. We then hard cut to a flashback to Picard's youth. He's French because all French boys, irrespective of time period, wear berets, and he appears awed by a glass conservatory. Future space captain Hugo explores further, intercut with his decrepit present version. There is then a sequence receding away from Earth to show the vastness of space. A sequence that seems almost identical to the sequence at the beginning of the 1997 film Contact. After a brief interlude in which some action, drama, suspense or compelling entertainment threatens to break out, this is quickly extinguished to make way for more domestic fretting as Picard fossicks about for an old book, and there is some subsisting tension with his two decades younger housekeeper before Picard travels out to address some Starfleet cadets. In the long-standing Star Trek tradition of elder statesmen wistfully and demurely accepting the honours of a younger generation, a trope mastered by William Shatner, who enacted it to diminishing returns of sentimentality, pathos and nostalgia in every film post Wrath of Khan. We then pivot to scenes involving the character of Agnes, who was a tipsy, unfiltered, and, by Hollywood standards at least, a quirky but clever character. Basically, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's fleabag, crossed with Kristen Wiig, crossed with that semi-goth chick from NCIS. She flirts awkwardly with bald beta male guy, then makes her way aboard a spaceship, captained by a vaguely Lothario type, whose most odd and obtrusive character tick is that he chews on a cigar and flicks at a lighter, but never the twain do meet. Amongst them, and later with 7x9, or 2x4, or whatever her name is, there is chiding cavalier banter, in jarring disregard of etiquette and the formal setting of a massive militarized professional vessel, which gives the impression many of the writers aren't especially grown up and have only a limited notion of such things as mature comportment and decorum. We then return to Picard's storyline, where he encounters a recently graduated cadet, the first full-blooded Romulan one, which seems like an interesting character to develop, until the actor opens his mouth and outsplurts the most hilariously thick Australian accent imaginable. Not a Mel Gibson or Russell Crowe-esque rich tombra, but the accent of someone who has laden their barbie with shrimp, has cuddled a few koalas, has just emerged from the surf at Bondi Beach, and lived with the family from the castle, making it nigh on impossible to take this character seriously as one from a race of unsympathetic, shrewd, ruthless opportunists. Back to the cigar-chomping captain, and E equals MC squared lady, and there is a sequence where Agnes, despite her tipsiness, attempts to decipher a garbled space message. A scene more or less identical to the deciphering of the interstellar garbled message of Whale Song by Uhura in Star Trek The Voyage Home. It turns out that the message is asking for Picard himself. We are then treated to quite a nice reprieve from the mediocrity of two-dimensional modern characters when Picard reunites with Whoopi Goldberg's Skynan, and it is genuinely affecting to see two old pros and legacy characters play off each other exuding tenderness and a long shared history, and showing their established acting chops. It almost doesn't even matter that the sequence doesn't especially have any bearing on anything or move the plot along in the slightest. 
Picard is then transported aboard the roguishly, straggly-haired captain's ship to bring the various plot threads together and raise the collective character charisma index by sheer dint of reputation. Again, Patrick Stewart is incessantly shot in ways that seem to reveal or even emphasise his diminished physical stature as a senior actor. It's also worth posing the question, what is the deal with these Starship bridges nowadays? This one seems more akin to the entirety of the interior of NASA Mission Control, or a tacky, half-deserted 2000s mega nightclub than the flight deck of a spaceship. Anyway, a big green space hole has ripped open, and through this interstellar sphincter is expelled legacy show bad guys, the Borg. Their queen, who looks a lot like that Venom crossover thing, transports aboard the ship and takes control of the consoles, and chaos ensues with Picard attempting to blow the ship up to prevent the hostile takeover from being completed. It is then that Picard wakes up disoriented, and after stumbling around for a while, and getting no help from bald-headed beta male robot guy, encounters Legacy Character 3, Derold Q, who after a budget-ravaging few moments of Luke skywalker and de-aging to his face, appears as the current-aged actor. And that's the plot of Episode 1 of Picard. The overarching concern with the show is everything revolves around and hinges upon a protagonist who is conspicuously in need of a real retirement, not a bucolic, on-screen fictional one. The show functions awkwardly and stiltedly around Patrick Stewart, who often seems more of a nominal central character than an active one. It's like some old institution, an ancient monarchy perhaps, where the regent is doddery and doesn't have much functional relevance, but his presence is still essential as a pillar around which the palace intrigues and ambitions and routines revolve. Outside of the legacy characters, the new characters are bland, their dialogue clunky and conventional, no one exudes authority or magnetism, and you don't remember any of their names unless Picard himself fondly alludes to them. All in all, the show fails because it combines a lacklustre attempt to capture the slow pacing, thoughtfulness and subdued tensions of the original films, particularly as conveyed by Kirk with the silliest, most indulgent, brightly coloured sheens and lens flares and campy, frenetic action of the J.J. Abrams reboots, and meshes it all together with the very conventional, television episodish feel of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's none of these elements done especially well, resulting in what's really not much more than superficial Star Trek product, something that, in its composite elements, gives the feeling of looking like Star Trek more than it actually is Star Trek, without much heart, depth, intrigue, or really much point.